Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all our witnesses. I think I'm on. Um, so 1998, I had uh, just got out of grad school, was overeducated, um, full of myself, which means I got a job as an energy consultant where I spent lots of time pulling big data sets, trying to find relationships and writing memos for my clients and my bosses, um, telling them um, how much I more I understood about the energy industry than they do, because that's what, that's what smart 26-year-olds do, um, <laughs> at least in the economy of 1998. I tell that story only because almost two decades later, I was the CEO of an energy company where I wrote a piece of code to pull through a lot of those same data sets that I knew, um, ran some algorithms to chug through it, find some relationships. It was fascinating. We were able to predict our customers' energy loads better than they could predict their energy loads. And I didn't have to hire some, some annoying 25-year-old younger version of myself um, to do that work. And, and I say that not to overdraw from my own experience. I'm, I think, cautious of not doing that. But at the same time, I remember talking to my head of engineering at the time, and, and I said, this is weird that I have this amazingly powerful predictive tool, and I don't actually understand what the relationships are. I just know it works. And, and he said that in his experience, every advance in technology gives us more precision and less knowledge. Welcome to the revolution. Um, I, I guess, Ms. Whitaker, I want to build on what Congressman Min was asking when we have advances in technology and labor productivity, we always create more jobs than we destroy. We almost never create jobs for the people whose jobs were destroyed. And I think we, we always underestimate the political backlash that happens when people who had certain expectations about where their life was going to go all of a sudden don't have those opportunities. Would I be oversimplifying to say that the, the part of our economy we need to be sensitive to right now are some version of 25-year-old me, young people who collect big data sets, you know, are smart enough to understand that and look for memos, and now I can have an AI bot do that in, in an hour. So why do I need your help? You know, I mean, I think of finance, of medicine, of engineering. The, is, is that where the dislocations are that we should be not stopping, but being sensitive to? I think the honest answer is we really don't know. Um, AI is so broadly applicable um, that it really could touch on people at every stage of their career. The sort of early indications are that the people who are being initially affected are sort of people at the, the entry level of their career. Um, but we don't know where it's going to go yet. It's in early stages of adoption. And so we really need that data and the sort of macro level insight into how AI is actually changing the workforce. Okay. I mean, I... I mean, I think about, I remember meeting with President Sisi of Egypt a long time ago and talking about the way that their country subsidized oil, oil use. And I said, if you took away these subsidies, your economy would be more efficient. And he said, then I'd have large numbers of unemployed young men, and you know what that does to a society. Right? Like, how do we think about that? Um, second related question, I could go on an AI algorithm and say, write a write a song about 25-year-old me in a, in a Robert Johnson blues style, and it could pull that off pretty quick. I can't go on AI and say invent the blues. So how, do, how should we be thinking about how to make sure that as we, as we democratize expertise, we still have an economic incentive to become an expert? You know, who's, who's going to set the new paradigms that future AI is going to be programmed to? Who's going to invent the new music? Who's going to be, you know, the people coming up with new creative you know, ways to shake the way that we think about the world in a world that's basically looking for trends and existing theories? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that the reality is that human creativity has always existed and will always exist. Um, and I think of AI as a tool that empowers creativity rather than replacing it. To your point, AI is not going to invent the blues. It's not going to invent jazz, right? Those are uniquely human experiences. Um, and AI is really good at certain things, but it's not very good at replicating those uniquely human experiences. And so I think but, but, human but I creativity I'm, will always be there. But I'm thinking as much about creativity as, you know, figuring out that the earth doesn't revolve around, that the, the universe doesn't revolve around the earth. You know, every scientific paradigm was from somebody who said the way we're looking at the data is wrong. It's, I mean, these are big philosophical questions. Let me, let me, let me get even more philosophical, because what the hell, we're here. Uh, <laughs> Every one of the, you know, the big AI CEOs who I've had the privilege to meet with, we end up getting in this conversation that says, 
you could in theory write your code to comply with every law, but nobody wants an algorithm that refuses to break the law. Because all of us know that ethically, sometimes I want to swerve around the yellow line because there's something in the road that that's the right thing to do. And yet nobody knows how to code ethics. So what, how should we be thinking about a tool that is out there, you know, and I know Mr. Reinhardt, you've been an advocate for, for saying that, you know, there shouldn't be any regulation of these tools. But if the people who develop these tools are saying, people won't buy it if I make sure that it complies with the law, and frankly, I don't even know how to define an ethical framework, how should we be thinking? Because it, it feels like we're, the tools are amazingly powerful, I'm not knocking them but we're letting these tools into the wild where people are, people are falling in love and having sexual relationships with a chatbot. That is really weird, right? And it was an ethical choice to let that thing get into the wild and create some pretty dysfunctional relationships. It was an ethical choice to put you know, Facebook algorithms out that are encouraging people to join white nationalist hate groups because I figured out that's a good way to optimize my algorithm to revenue. How do we think about a tool that, according to all of its own founders, we can't program in legal compliance or ethical compliance? I do think that there's a role for the government here. Um, I, I don't know that the private sector should just be sort of left to its own devices. There is, role, there is a role for the government to adopt a safety framework to understand how these systems are working and to have sort of basic guidelines for um, what is and is not appropriate, what sort of um, capabilities they should and shouldn't have. Um, so I do think that there's a role for the federal government to sort of figure out those ethical contours. Thank you for helping me earn my dissertation in yeah, philosophy. It, <laughs> <You'll bet. laughs> now I'm very nervous if we had met the 25-year-old you. <laughs> Ms. Moore. <laughs> 